In this lecture, we examine the Lagrange multiplier method. In Module 1, we cover the basic concepts of the method. Module 2 deals with how we interpret the Lagrange multiplier, lambda. We'll also look at the intuition behind the method. And in Module 3, we develop the second order conditions for a Lagrange multiplier problem. In Lectures 6 and 7, we examined unconstrained optimization problems. In other words, we had a function of one or more variables, and we wanted to find the extreme points for the function, either local or global. There were no other considerations or constraints to take into account. However, many interesting economic problems are constrained optimization problems. A constraint that most people face is a budget constraint. We don't have unlimited funds to satisfy our wants. A constraint on firms is their ability to produce goods, that is, their production function. We'll see other examples of constraints as we work through the exercises associated with this topic. There are two parts to a constrained optimization problem. First, there's a function we want to find the optimal value for. This is called the objective function. Since we're optimizing the function, we're finding either the maximum or minimum value of the function. The second part to a constrained optimization problem is that there is at least one constraint. So we maximize or minimize the objective function subject to the constraint. In this course, we'll restrict ourselves to problems with only one constraint. That's sufficient to understand the principles, and it's easily extended. The first step in a constrained optimization problem is to define the objective function and the constraints, and you should always set them out in this form. Note here the constraint is an equality. We can also have inequality constraints, both linear and nonlinear. These types of problems are dealt with in linear and nonlinear programming. First, let's set up a simple problem, then we'll see how to formulate it and solve it as a constrained optimization problem. A consumer obtains utility from consuming two goods, x1 and x2. Here's our consumer's utility function. It tells us something about these goods. Consumer gains utility from consuming good x1 by itself, but she also gains utility when she consumes some x2 with x1. Good x2 is not consumed by itself. For example, x1 could be coffee and x2 a chocolate cookie. So our consumer drinks coffee by itself and sometimes increases her satisfaction by having a chocolate cookie with her coffee. Now our consumer has a budget of $60 for coffee and cookies. Coffee is $4, and a cookie is $2. So the left-hand side of the budget constraint shows the combination of coffees and cookies that our consumer can afford. The budget constraint means that the optimal values of x1 and x2 are not independent. They're mutually dependent. You might have come across this type of problem represented graphically in microeconomics. We have a graph with the quantities of x1 and x2 on the axes. We can draw indifference curves that show the combinations of x1 and x2 that give the consumer the same utility. Because these combinations give the consumer the same utility, she's indifferent about the various combinations along this line. Here we have lots of x1 and very little x2. Up here we have lots of x2 and very little x1. Consuming more of both goods has a higher utility than consuming less of both goods. So utility increases as the indifference curves move further from the origin. So how does a consumer choose the best combination of x1 and x2? This is where the budget constraint comes in. The budget line represents the combinations of x1 and x2 when the consumer spends the full $60. Of course, the consumer chooses the combination of x1 and x2 that maximizes her utility. Let's see what happens to utility as we move along the budget line. We can start at point A and go to point B. So this will be A and this will be B. As we move along the budget line, utility is increasing up to this point and then it's decreasing. So we see that utility reaches its maximum point here. That's that point. This is the point where the budget line is just tangential to an indifference curve. This is a three-dimensional representation of a constrained optimization problem. In earlier lectures, we found the free maximum of a function, the unconstrained maximum, up here. 
Now we'll learn how to find the constrained maximum. So given this constraint, we find the maximum. We want a method that finds that point algebraically. Let's return to our coffee and cookies. In a simple problem like this, we can rearrange the objective function and solve it using unconstrained optimization. First, we take the budget constraint and solve for x2. We have x2 in terms of x1. We substitute for x2 in the objective function, and so now we have utility as a function of x1. That takes care of the mutual dependence, and it also gives us a function of one variable that we can optimise. We apply the first order condition, differentiate with respect to x1, and solve for x1. So the optimal value for x1 is 8. We substitute back into this equation, and that gives us x2. We can show that's a maximum by looking at the second order conditions. The second derivative is always negative. Our function is concave. We have a global maximum. However, we can only take this approach with the simplest of problems. For constrained optimization problems that are in any way interesting, we need to turn to the Lagrange multiplier method. The first thing we do is to state the problem in mathematical terms. In other words, we define the objective function and whether it's to be maximized or minimized, then we state the constraint. The key to the Lagrange multiplier method is the next step. We form a new function that combines the objective function and the constraint. It's called the Lagrange function or the Lagrangian. We represent it by a curly L. Here's the objective function and here's the constraint. We now have a function of three variables, x, y and lambda. Lambda is the Lagrange multiplier. We find its value as well as the optimal values of x and y when we solve the problem. We find the optimal values of x and y and lambda by applying the multivariate optimization methods we learned in lecture 7. Let's have a closer look at the Lagrangian. The first term is the objective function, that's fairly straightforward. The second term is made up of the constraint. We take the constraint from this form and rewrite it in this way. g of x and y minus c is equal to zero. We multiply the left hand side by lambda and subtract it from the objective function. In some textbooks you might see that the second term is added to the objective function. In that case the constraint is given as c minus g of x, y. We should stick to this method. The second term incorporates the constraint, but since g of x, y minus c is equal to zero, then the objective function is also satisfied when the Lagrangian is satisfied. Let's look at that on a diagram. Here we have the constraint on the xy plane. We can write that g of xy minus c is equal to zero. The objective function then is constrained to follow this line in the x y plane. And that's what the Lagrangian function does. That means the optimal value of the constrained objective function is somewhere along this line. All the values along that line satisfy the function f of x. We can see if we apply the first order conditions to the Lagrangian along this line, we'll find the local maximum or minimum. In this case we obviously have a concave function so it would be the constrained maximum. How do we find that point? We can take the first partial derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to x and y. Many textbooks other than one we use, also show that we can differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to lambda. Lambda is a constant, and for each constrained optimization problem it has a particular value, but we can treat it as a variable and differentiate the function with respect to it. I mention it in case you come across this form in another course. We'll see how our textbook treats the first order conditions in just a moment. This slide sets out the Lagrange multiplier method for finding the optimal values of x and y. There are four steps. Follow these steps and you'll always be on the right track. As I mentioned earlier, the first step is always to define the problem in a mathematical way. Next we form the Lagrangian. Step three is finding the first order conditions. We differentiate with respect to x and y and set the first partials equal to zero. When we include the constraint, we have three equations and three unknowns, x, y and lambda. In step four we solve for these three, and this is usually the trickiest part of this type of problem. 
Now that we've outlined the method, let's go back to our example and put it into practice. We saw earlier how we can solve this example by simplifying it and treating it as a univariate optimization problem. Now let's see how we can solve it as a Lagrange multiplier problem. The first step is to write down the problem in mathematical terms. In this case we nearly have it in that form already, but it's always a good place to start. We're going to maximise utility. u equals x1 times x2 plus 2x1 subject to the budget constraint 4x1 plus 2x2 is equal to 60. The next step is to form the Lagrangian. We designate the Lagrange function by our curly L. It's equal to the objective function x1 times x2 plus 2x1 minus lambda times g of x1 x2 minus c that will be 4x1 plus 2x2 minus 60. The third step is to solve for the first order conditions. We differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to x1, so L1 prime. For the first term we treat x2 as a constant and differentiate x1, so it'll be 1 times x2 plus 2 minus, it might help at this stage to expand the last term, so it will be minus lambda 4x1, and here we need to be careful with the sign, so it will be minus lambda 2x2 plus 60. These two terms are constant with respect to x1, so our last term in this partial derivative will be 4 lambda, and we set that equal to 0. We differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to x2, will be x1. The derivative with respect to x2 of the second term is 0, skip that, so we minus 2 lambda is equal to 0. In this case, this term and this term are constants with respect to x2. Our third condition is the constraint, so we put 4x1 plus 2x2 is equal to 60. We can number the equations, 1, 2, and 3. From equation 1, just rearranging that, we'll have that x2 is equal to 4 lambda minus 2. From equation 2, we have x1 is equal to 2 lambda. We want to solve for x1, x2, and lambda. There are various ways we can proceed from here. The simplest way in this case is to substitute for x1 and x2 in equation 3. We'll do that. Substituting in for x1, we'll have 4 times 2 lambda plus 2 times x2 will be 2 times 4 lambda minus 2 is equal to 60. 8 lambda plus 8 lambda minus 4 equals 60. Simplifying that, we solve for lambda, which is 4 x1 equals 2 lambda, so it's equal to 8. We'll call that x1 star since the optimal solution. And x2 star is equal to 4 lambda minus 2, and that's equal to 14. So we have our optimal values for x1 and x2, and a value for lambda. If we assume these optimal values are a maximum, we can find the consumer's maximum utility. And that's equal to 128. In the next module, we'll see how we interpret lambda. And in module 3, we'll look at the second order conditions, by which we can show that this stationary point is actually a local maximum.